Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that I do. Um, I s developed this uh, kind of workshop called Clinician's Eye with, in cooperation with the University of Virginia Medical School. Um, when I arrived at the University of Virginia um, in 2012. Um, it helps when you're developing partnerships to have someone on the inside who can, uh, who can help out with uh, gathering participants, spreading the word, getting you part of the curriculum in a particular school. Um, so it, I've been very um, happy and uh, honored to work with uh, the professor of bioethics um, in the University of Virginia Medical School who believes in uh, workshops like this. Um, and Marcia Childress is, not only does she teach bioethics, she has a PhD in English. So she's very much rooted in the humanities and kind of understands the value of humanities um, outside of humanities. So, so anyway, that's where we're coming from. Um, and, and we developed this workshop, Clinician's Eye, um, for the medical school, but I've also done it with a lot of other groups, including engineering, architecture, um, sciences. Um, we train the docents very much this way. Our we have a core of 60 student docents. Um, it's a do student docent program that's been going on for over 30 years. We have one of the oldest student docent programs in the country. Um, and you can't always teach student docents you know, thousands of years of art history. You have to teach them how to look so that they can teach other people how to look. Um, and also our core of 20 to 30 community docents. Uh, so it's, it's them that helps us reach about 5,000 K through 12 students in the local area every single year. Um, and it also helps us uh, reach out to the broader University of Virginia um, student body. Um, so, so this is just one of the workshops we develop um, that can be tailored to all kind of different groups. So I'm going to uh, walk you through it. All right. Um, one of the things that I sometimes do, um, not necessarily in the museum, but for example with our neurology residents, they are all constantly being paged. So when they do a workshop with them, I go to the hospital. And I do different videos with them. And one of the videos that I have done in the past, but a lot of people may have heard of, is um, the video of students passing a basketball back and forth. And the great thing about this video, which is on YouTube, and it's, it was uh, done by a Harvard University um, um, psychology group in 1999, is that um, it demonstrates how our eyes can deceive us. It's kind of the first thing that you can do to teach students about what they're not seeing. Now what happens in the video is that students in white shirts pass a basketball back and forth to each other and students in black shirts pass the basketball back and forth. And you ask your students to count how many times the students in white t-shirts pass the basketball. Now what you don't tell them is during this short three minute video, a person in a gorilla suit will pass through the video, stop, beat their chest, and continue onward. Now, one of the things they don't realize is that because you've asked them to count the basketball, about half of them will never see the gorilla. It's right there on the screen with an arrow. <laughs> they won't see it. They won't see it. They'll look directly at it and won't see it. This tells, this is called selective attention. And it's something that they teach in uh, cognitive psychology that when you are asked to do a specific task, it kind of puts blinders on you. And you will have a tendency to miss things that other people might find obvious. So we're not quite sure why half people don't see it and why half, pe half of the people do. I've also found that people who do see the gorilla tend not to have as accurate counts at the end of the exercise in terms of the basketball passing. For the relevance for the medical field is that if you have someone who's going to see the gorilla and someone who's going to see and not see the gorilla but maybe have an accurate count for basketball passes, it would seem as though the best team would be a variety of those people because that way everybody's bringing something of value to the table. 
So that's one of the reasons why I show this video sometimes. And some people know about the video and some don't. But I always ask them, how many of you, when you first saw this, didn't see the gorilla? And of course, I know some people are going to lie and say they saw it. Um, but um, a lot of people will admit to the fact that they didn't. And I said, well, you're you know, part of the crowd. You're a, a, a good 50% have not. And I remember when I first saw this video that I saw the gorilla, but I had no memory of, of the gorilla beating their chest. I had no memory of that. I remember kind of sensing the gorilla crossing the stage, but then having no memory of it stopping or doing anything. So there are all kinds of details that you can miss when you're hyper-focused on one particular task. And the advantage of knowing that your brain does that means that you won't always place so much importance on what you see because you know that there are always going to be some things that you miss. So that's one of the ways that I start talking about art before we even get to art. Because I think one of the things that for medical school students or non-art historians is, well, how is the art relevant to me? How is it relevant to me? And if I get them to start thinking about how their brain works and what they see and what they don't see, then, and, and then demonstrate that art is a great, just fun way to practice that, then they start to kind of get the idea of why we're doing this and the importance and the ramifications of it. So, all right. There was a follow-up study. They dis Harvard decided a few years later that they were going to practice that video on radiologists not just any medical school students, but radiologists. Radiologists are uh, medical professionals who have to read x-rays, MRIs, that sort of thing, to look for tumors, other, and things of that nature. So they took a group of radiology students and asked them to look at slides of lungs, a pair of lungs, and look for lung cancer. Uh, so they took a look at this very slide. Uh, they wore special visual uh, goggles that would track their uh, eye movements. Um, and they uh, discovered that um, what they didn't realize and what no one told them what there was there was actually going to be a gorilla on the slide. And so after they went through the exercise, they asked them, did you see anything unusual? And what do you, how many people do you think saw the gorilla on the slides? I'll actually point him out. He's there. Does anyone see the gorilla? He's about the size of, of, of um, he's about uh, the size of an 8 by 11 piece of paper. It's a little, if we dim the lights, you could probably see it better, but he's right here. Okay, he's raising his fist. So anyway, so they saw a much, okay. See, does he pop out? Boom, there he is. Okay. <laughs> so how many of the 24 radiology students who saw this slide in good conditions, you know, there's a PowerPoint can only do so much. How many of those 24 radiology students do you think saw the gorilla? Any guesses? Well, <laughs> a pessimist. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a good guess, yeah? Anybody else a little more optimistic? Close. Four <laughs> out of 24. And all of them, when they were wearing the goggles, all of them looked directly at it. All of them looked directly at it at one point or another. So it suggests to them that, um, that uh, this sort of task, it also uh, applies to uh, radiologists who are specially trained to look for visual cues. Um, so, so anyway, pointing these things out to uh, the medical school students when I workshop with them makes me, um, it, it's, it's something I'm trying to get across to them that they should value their visual analysis skills, but not necessarily take them for granted, and also not overestimate their own abilities. 
and be aware of the blind spots that we all have. And that that is the reason for having group consensus about case studies, because someone's going to see the gorilla and point it out. And don't assume that everyone's going to see the same things you are. It's OK to point out the obvious, because there's going to be someone who didn't see that and is going to be glad that you spoke up. But it is hard in the medical uh, setting because everyone's trying to prove how smart they are all the time. No one wants to admit that they don't see anything. And I said, sometimes you just have to state the obvious and, and just be brave enough to state the obvious. And also, there's a hierarchy. You're going to have seasoned uh, physicians in the room, young residents who you know, maybe feel embarrassed to point out something because they don't want to look stupid in front of their, their professor. Um, and so you have nurses who are going to point things out. Um, so there is kind of a hierarchy in the hospital that can sometimes get in the way, you know, or intimidate people from speaking up. And so art is a great way where everyone's on the same playing field. And if you get used to speaking up in the art museum, you'll be more comfortable doing it in the hospital setting. Especially if you know that everyone, no matter if you're a newbie or you're a seasoned professional, everybody has these blind spots. So if you know that, you're more collaborative. You embrace the colla collaboration. All right. So, you know, I ask them, I say, does visual analysis help me? And this is actually important, whether you're in the medical field or you're in the sciences or whatever. My father's a geologist and an anthropologist. And so he taught me from a very early age to be observant. And of course, I didn't know what that meant. Um, but I got a sense of what that meant. And my mom was an English professor and did all kinds of analysis with text. So it makes sense that I became an art historian measure, you know, uh, doing the analysis with the visual. And they kind of got married. And yet my parents were still like, you're going into art history? What are you going to do with that? I'm like, really, you guys? You're in the humanities. It's a little late to be worried about that now. But um, there are things. There are ways where this kind of visual analysis is widely applicable. And sometimes you don't even think about it. Um, so when students of any stripe ask me about this, I say, I talk about the Yale study. Ira Braverman, dermatologist, did a pre and post study with his dermatology students in between, before and after a visit to the Yale Art Gallery with a workshop like this. And he found that they improved their diagnostic ability looking at skin conditions, images of skin conditions, by 10% with just an hour and a half visit to the museum. One, one visit. It suggests that there's something going on here, that art can, can open uh, your uh, visual thinking, open your creative mind in ways that will help you in other areas. Um, UT San Antonio uh, did a similar study. And um, on, uh, on the, a place called PubMed, which is a location where all the medical papers are printed and published, um, UT San Antonio talked about, in their paper, a collaboration with the McNay Art Museum and the UT San Antonio um, Medical School. And they found, through their workshops, that um, it improved observation skills, but also communication between participants, and also tolerance for ambiguity. And someone was talking about that earlier. What is tolerance for ambiguity? What is that? What is to the tolerance for ambiguity? Why would an art museum help that? What is that? Yeah? Your ability to sit with the unknown. Yes. Are we good at that as a society? No ways. No. <laughs> no, we don't like not knowing. Yeah. Um, pro tip, med students aren't either. <laughs> they think that if there, there's got to be a solution. And if they just study hard enough, they'll find it. And they always assume that there's one solution. And so part of coming to the art museum is the fact that we like to point out that we don't always know what the art in artist intended. 
Sometimes we live with ambiguity and we have to be okay with that. Maybe those multiple interpretations. There's not just one thing that the artist is trying to say. Maybe there are things that the artist is saying with his work that he, had, he or she had no idea could be read that way. So, so in art history, we kind of know that, there, that there's always going to be kind of an open-ended uh, situation with any artwork. I'm a medievalist. All my artists are dead. I can't ask them. There's no paper trail a lot of times. So we have to just kind of live with the fact that we won't have all the answers. And that's fine. So as long as the med students realize they're in the same boat, they're going to have situations where patients are going to have multiple things going on, some related, some not related. So if they can get comfortable with the fact that this is going to be the norm for them in seeing patients, uh, the more comfortable in their abilities they'll be. You know, they won't, uh, they won't beat themselves up over not finding the right answer, you know, or that one answer that'll explain everything. You know, this isn't the detective novel, you know, who had who done it. So that's one thing San Antonio found. Um, also, they found that their students had an appreciation for multiple perspectives. They heard from what other people were saying. Um, and here is the biggest takeaway if you remember nothing else today, it's the biggest takeaway from any sort of visual analysis workshop is it teaches people not to jump to conclusions. That is the biggest thing. What do we do when we see, uh, when we see a, a, an advertisement, a commercial, when we see a person walking down the street? Do we start making immediate assumptions about them? And we don't really know, you know? This is like 21st century journalism, isn't it? <laughs> Jumping to conclusions. There's always, and in the classroom setting, you might have a situation where students are maybe afraid to raise their hand. Why are they afraid to raise their hand? Hmm? Ridicule, yeah. Where would that ridicule come from? Their peers, why would, their, why would their peers ridicule them for an answer, for a wrong answer? So there's pressure to get a right answer all the time, isn't there? You know? Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's part of jumping to conclusions is that it's assumed that you have to have the right answer. It's assumed that you can't just kind of ask an open-ended question or that you could experiment and just throw something out there and say, well, could it be this, you know? That's, so the, a lot of uh, the, uh, what I do is getting people to not jump to conclusions. And it's very easy when you're looking at a work of art to jump to conclusions, especially for med students because the first thing they like to do is diagnose the person in the painting with an illness, even if there's no Ill illness there. That's what they want to do. Well, that's great, especially if, you know, there are obvious signs of illness. But if that's the only thing they're doing, then they're going to miss out on all the other information in the painting. Um, they're, they're like hyper-focused. They're like just looking for the basketball and not looking for the gorilla. So, so that's what I want them to not do right now. That could be a focused uh, activity for much later. But if I want them to take in the whole work, I don't want them to diagnose it. Um, so that is uh, one thing that UT San Antonio realized. Um, there was also a group at USC, University of Southern California, that partnered uh, with the LA County Museum. And um, they found that it was really good at team building. It made their students better listeners because they were listening to other people's perspectives. It made them better analytical thinkers. Um, and they found that the whole process of visual analysis was the same across disciplines, whether you were in medicine, whether you were in um, criminal justice, whether you were in scientific ear inquiry. And that is, you make observations you take in multiple interpretations, multiple observations from other people. 
you sort through ambiguous evidence. Which of these things is important and which of these things is not? Which of these things are connected on this list? And what's extraneous information? Then collaborate with others. Collaborating with others, getting other people's points of view. And finally, coming to a consensus and then turning that into action. This is true whether it's art history. If I'm trying to do research on an artwork, I'm going to make all kinds of observations of it. I'm going to think about what the interpretations of those observations are. I'm going to maybe uh, decide that some evidence isn't important and some evidence is going to be more important. I'm going to ask other scholars, well, what do you do think of this when you looked at this? And then I'm going to come to a consensus with my information and publish it and put it out there. And it's going to be the same thing if you have a group of detectives at a crime scene. It's the same process. And so if you think about it that way, it's applicable to just about every field out there. That we're, this is the process we're doing almost unconsciously in our field of work. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, and that I like to point out to students, is that what they see in art or in any, any visual analysis is that they're, what they notice is culturally shaped. And lucky for me, there was actually a study in 2009 on uh, how people looked at visual imagery. They took a group of people from China, a group of people from Singapore, a group of people in the United States, and a group of people in Europe. And they showed them a ser four sets of four images. And you'll notice in the first set, everything stays the same, the background and the foreground object. Everything is the same. In the second one, the foreground object remains the same, but the background changes. In the third one, it's the opposite. The background stays the same, and the foreground object changes. And in the fourth group, both change. The foreground object and the background object. So how do you think these different groups saw these images? They definitely saw them differently. What, what, in your gut, what do you think? How do you think they saw them differently? Any ideas? Do you mean saw them differently from the other groups compared to the other groups saw them? Yes. Yes. And so, instead of using those categories, old, 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 new, new, old, new, new, they had different categories? They had no categories. They said, you're going to look at four different sets of images and note what you see and what you notice, any changes, that sort of thing. Any ideas how they would have seen things differently? The Asian participants versus the Western participants. What do you think, Selka? Uh, we may focus more on landscape or the object or some of those, or background, foreground, middle ground. Yeah, yeah. What if, if you go into, yeah? Well, that's true. I don't think they saw them in this format. I think they saw them one at a time. Yeah. That's true. I don't think they had these, uh, these categories. This is just for the analysis later. Yeah. Grouping things together that were the same versus like identifying what was different about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They definitely kind of registered processing different parts of the image differently. When you go into, say, uh, the Nelson Atkins and you go into, say, the Renaissance Gallery, what, what kind of artworks are you going to see? Portraits. Which have what? A foreground object, a person. Do they often have a background? Not always. Not always. And if they do have a background, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. train, always in landscape, something like that. Um, yeah. So we have been conditioned since medieval times to see a foreground object. Okay? Altar pieces, let me tell you, medieval, medieval uh, altar pieces, you've got the Virgin Mary and Jesus, and a gold background. Nothing's going on back here. <laughs> so 
So this shows that from a very early, early times in Western culture, there was an emphasis on foreground object. And so the art just repeated it and repeated it and repeated it and repeated it. Landscape comes in, but there's always like a cow or a ship or a tree in the foreground. You never have like a wide swath of things. There's always still a foreground object, okay? So we have been kind of, as, as any Western lookers, conditioned to look that way. In Asia, early, early, early Asian hand scroll paintings and artworks, it's a wide swath of landscape. There's no one object in the center. There are tiny people and animals moving in and out and through it, but it's all about the big picture. And nothing is more important than anything else. It's only later after they started trading with Western cultures that some of their 18th and 19th century art start focusing on a particular person, such as the emperor. Um, so, so uh, and also the culture would reinforce that, this idea of uh, privileging the group over the individual, right? Whereas in Western culture, this idea of individualism, we privilege the individual over the, the group. And so the culture reinforces the art, which reinforces how you're looking at the art. And so it really, it should, when you think about this, it then doesn't come as a big surprise that what happened was the uh, Chinese and Singapore groups noticed the change in background more than they noticed any other changes. In fact, a group in the Singapore, a few group of uh, elderly fishermen in the Singapore group didn't register a change in the foreground object at all. They couldn't remember what the foreground object was. They didn't register that there had been a change. Uh, they were totally and utterly focused on the background. Now, of course, the European and American viewers were much more focused on the foreground object changing. Sometimes they didn't even notice that the background had changed. So if you think about it this way, it suggests that if you have a group of students working together, you're going to notice more in an artwork or notice more in a situation the more diverse the group is because we're all culturally conditioned to notice certain things. So, so this also wa uh, wakens up uh, students to the idea that everything they see has been carefully crafted over their lifetimes. And, by, and they have blinders with regards to culture, and they have blinders with regards to the way their brain works. And so if they know this, then they're going to be more aware of what they notice and more aware of what uh, other people may catch that they might miss. So they won't assume, this is the key thing, they won't assume that they've seen everything there. They'll start to realize eyewitness testimony can be faulty, you know. So, um, so these are kind of just some of the ways that this uh, applies in their everyday life. And here's the interesting part. We haven't even gotten to artwork yet. <laughs> this is how I lure them in. <laughs> so here's another way I lure them in. I ask them, what's the most common image you see all, day, all week? What, are the, what is the most common image you see all week? Whether you're watching TV or whether you're flipping through your cell phone, what are you seeing most often? Hmm? Well, food, but commercials in general, right? I think, I think there was an estimate that um, a person sees up to 10,000 commercials per week. <laughs> uh, whether it's on uh, social media, whether it's on television, or even billboards, billboards as you're driving to work. So, um, and if there's one thing that advertisers know, it's images. And so that's another realm outside of art of Im the way we process images is through advertising. Now, the interesting thing we can learn about images from advertising is the fact that uh, the longer you take to think about a purchase, the less likely you are to make it. 
So what does that say to you as an advertiser? How are you going to design your commercial? Axe nail. Hmm? Axe nail. Deal's good for just camera. Right. Hurry, hurry. Don't think about it. You're going to miss out, right? Also, if you're showing a 30-minute com or 30-second commercial, you want to flash a lot of images on there because you don't want them to sit and think about what they're looking at. You don't want to talk to their conscious mind. You want, who's like, hmm, I don't know about that. There's too many calories. Or I, I don't have the budget for that purchase. You want to talk to the unconscious mind who wants a third piece of pie. That's what you want to talk to. And so you get a really fabulous image and you flash it for a short amount of time. And that will start sinking in. So here is another study on images in advertising. It was uh, unhealthy food ads and when, what time of day they're usually shown. Weekdays, Saturdays, Sundays, uh, dark at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., light 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., kind of during the day. Then you have right at the dinner hour, and then you have late night. Why is Saturday so high? Yeah, yeah. So they took a group of children and adults. They showed them 30 minutes of commercials. One was commercials of food, unhealthy food. The other was commercials for cars, computers, non-food commercials. And as they were watching, they set out bowls of snacks. <laughs> How much more food do you think the people watching the food commercials ate? Hmm? 45% more food consumed in 30 minutes. 45% more food. So you don't even have to be eating the food that's being advertised. You will eat if you see commercials that suggest delicious food. The other thing, too, is Saturday night, and like say Friday night and Saturday night, if you're home watching any show from like 8 to 10, you're going to see chocolate. You're going to see late night appetizer foods. See, next time you watch a show, count how many food commercials out of the total commercials you see. And whether or not that makes you go to the fridge and want to get a snack. This is like, this, they know our habits. They, advertising uses images to, uh, to manipulate how we think and to reach out to our unconscious mind. So the reason that I point this out to physicians especially is I said this is, you're going to have an obesity epidemic coming your, into your door. This is what you're up against. This is what they're up against. This is the struggle. If you know how images are being used on your patients, if you can point that out to them, then they'll be more conscious every time they see it and say, ah, I'm trying to be manipulated into eating more. If you're conscious of it, you're less likely to make that purchase. So here, so this is just some of the ways that images infiltrate our daily lives. Again, other purchases. Uh, you know, um, who do you think a Lamborghini is advertising to? Hmm? <laughs> well, what do we see? Let's do a visual analysis on Lamborghini, just like we would a Rembrandt. What do we see in the Lamborghini logo? A bull, yeah. How do how do we how do you get power? What are you seeing physically that tells you power? The muscles of the bull. I see movement. You see movement. It's turning. Gesture and turning. It's not just a stationary cow, right? Or stationary bull. It's like got some body movement to it. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Shield shape. The shield shape. What is the shield shape associated with? Uh, warriors. Warriors, yeah. How about you? Gold. Wealth. Gold. Wealth, yes. The shield shape also makes me think that you have to belong to a certain group of people to own it, so maybe exclusivity. 
So it's almost like a say a crest. Yeah, exactly. Like okay. It doesn't have to be a part of the club to have that. Right. So there's this idea of the crest, uh, which is associated with status. So now we've got we've got a power thing, we've got a wealth thing, we have a status thing. <laughs> Why would this appeal to males? Power wealth. Power wealth and status. Yeah. But it's not like women aren't, you know, lured by power, wealth, and status too. But what about this? Might appeal to, say, young males rather than females. That's how strong. Yeah. The kind of, the association of virile animals. The prominent horns. The prominent horns. I even think a bullish market is so, you know, mm -hmm. well invested. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can do hard. Yeah. What? Money thing. We'll right. Market, right. When you have a sports team, what mascot do you choose? A bunny? <laughs> uh, the, the state bird? Sometimes. But what, what, you know, what is Johnson County Community College uh, sports mascot? Cavaliers. Cavaliers, as is at the UVA. Cavalier, warrior, they carry a weapon, they ride a strong steed, and this is caught up in kind of the male desire to, you know, have the virility and power and the strength behind that, you know. So they know who they're talking to. Just in one logo, they've said all those messages we just pulled out. So this uh, is another way that I can start off a workshop with students and make them realize the, how they consume images in their everyday lives, how they take messages out of images of their everyday life. Because they'll come in and they'll be like, is, you know, oftentimes the medical students will be like, well, what can you tell me about medicine? So if you start them off with things that they process without even thinking about it, they'll start to be open to this idea that art is part of that, that art is uh, just another vehicle for visual communication and message. So these are just some of the, the introductory workshop uh, activities that I do. Feel free to steal them. <laughs> this is part of uh, kind of opening up, and especially everyone, there might be students in your classes who might be intimidated about talking about art. Maybe they don't know anything about art and they feel like they have to be smart enough to talk about it. If you start, start with advertising or some of the other images I've talked about, this is a way, everyone has seen advertising. Everyone can talk about advertising. So if you start with that, you get them warmed up, you know, so that they're more likely to chat about art later because they've kind of had this icebreaker where they had something that they could identify with that they could talk about. You know, it's less intimidating. You've started them down the road, okay? They love talking about apple. I'm like, why would, why would an apple be important? Why should we pick out an apple? What in history, where has an apple appeared in history? <laughs> Adam and Eve, right? What was that apple? Knowledge, Knowledge right? Some people will say Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton, the apple falling on his head. I'm like, that. well, that's tied to the biblical story, too, this idea. Mm -hmm. It's good for you. And then what do you give your teacher when you go to school? It's knowledge. Yeah, you give, you give the teacher an apple. It's almost like a knowledge exchange, you know? All right, so we are going to get to um, visual analysis. The second half here is visual analysis. So we're going to practice, okay? So let's do visual analysis here. What do you see? We're just going to talk about all the physical things we see here. Let's not even try to diagnose anything or, or try to figure out what's going on. I want to know everything that you notice. It's nighttime. How do we know it's nighttime? What tells you nighttime? It's dark outside the window. Is it dark outside? I think the blinds are just closed. This is like blinds coming in. Okay. Okay. See, the more we talk it out, the more we might, you know, see different things. Yeah. 
So we notice that it, maybe it's a dark interior, but the more we study the window, we more, the more we might think that that's, that might be blinds. Okay. Okay, what else do you see? Older An older couple. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with starting with the basics. Bird. Hmm? A bird. A bird? Yeah. Shadow in the background. A picture. A, a picture in the background? A picture in the background? Yeah. No one's looking at each other. No one's looking at each other. Yeah. The big, one of the biggest things that we do when we're looking at images of people is body language, right? And so, and that's important for medicine too. Is I'm just piggybacking on that. It's like the pertinent negative. So you're looking for things that are not there also. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You're looking at what's there and what's not there that you might expect to be there but don't see. Yeah, that is a good point. It kind of looks almost seafaring to me for some reason. I made the hat. Okay, so he's wearing this interesting hat, yes. And it reminds you of some hat that a, a mariner may wear. Okay. Hmm? She's so, been reading, she's got a book on her lap, so. She has a book on her lap? His posture is more open. Yes. And hers is more closed. Yes. How special occasion? How, what tells you special occasion? Because she's dressed up. It doesn't look like she would dress up like that every day. Right. She is wearing her, 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 a very kind of dressed up outfit. Now here's a question. How do we know it's dressed up? <coughs> what do you see that tells you dressed up? Because I know you looked at it and you thought dressed up. What tells you that it's dressed up? No, that's right. <laughs> yeah, lace. Uh huh. Now, what did you see? Well, I saw him as a steel worker, and he's dirty. He's dirty. And she's not. And she's not dirty. Yeah. Both of their hands. Well, how do we know manual labor from looking at hands? What do you look for? Knobby. Knobby. Yeah. Yeah. There's just kind of this lack of expression. There's discomfort with this lack of expression. They're just kind of like looking, but. Yeah, stony-faced on his part. What about her? What's her part? What's her expression? She looks pained. She looks pained. What on her expression tells you pained? What were you looking at? At the eyes? What about the eyes tells you pained? I think it's uh, partly the eyebrows, but it's also the, the eyes themselves just have kind of a downcast look to them. A downcast look. Yeah. I, I, I've already conjured a story that they lost. <laughs> you know, here, here's the funny thing about it. The people who, who oftentimes, my, my English professors like, love to create a narrative around it, okay? Because you have that kind of narrative-seeking mind. However, you have to be careful about creating narratives and then believing that they're there. <laughs> yes. This is like a photograph of her when she was younger, and it's almost, it, to me, his clothes look more modern than hers do, and it's almost as if she's hanging on to this, like, image of herself in the past. It's kind of an older style of dress where he's well, going out into the future. Right. Well, how do we know this is an older style of dress? She has, it looks, I don't know, mid-1800s to me with the collar. The collar. The shape of the skirt is billowy, the collar is high, and that says to you, late 1800s. What is she wearing now, in contrast? Shorter sleeves and a more open collar. Yes, asymmetrical. When did, when do our, we have a sense of when that came out? Shorter sleeves, when is it gonna be okay to wear shorter sleeves and an open collar? Hmm? I know you guys are thinking about it in the back. Yeah, yeah. Well, there appear, I mean, here we are with some ambiguous evidence, <laughs> right? We have a red cover of a book, but then we have this kind of reddish, flowerish looking thing there. So it's hard to say. 
It's hard to say. Okay, I'm stuck with Eric's idea of creating a narrative because to me, she's been a church as the Bible, yeah. and he's been working, and so she's kind of feeling that she's reading him in on what she got out of the church. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> well, the interest, yeah, the interesting thing about this that all of your comments read into is that they don't match. She's dressed up. She has a book which implies an indoor activity. Okay, we don't even have to guess whether it's the Bible or not. We imagine her on an interior, nice clothes, reading. And with his dirt, dirty clothes, is this everyday clothes? What is he wearing? Work clothes. So he has been in some exterior activity. They don't match in dress. They're not looking at each other. Their expressions don't match. And so we have, and this is kind of um, disjointed, I think. Is what you're saying? Is what I'm getting from you? And he has a nice white button-down starch shirt. He has a nice white shirt underneath these work clothes. Yeah. Now, if you're paying a portraitist to do you, to paint a portrait of you, are you going to be uh, showing up in your digs, in your dirt digs? If he's chosen to dress this way, what does that say? Well, his idea. Was it, his, was it not his idea, or what it was his idea? Maybe it wasn't her idea. <laughs> possibly, possibly. It's just unusual to have someone choose these clothes to sit for a portrait. Here's the interesting thing. Just by making a visual inventory of everything that we notice, and then taking some of those pieces and coming to a few conclusions with them, without jumping to conclusions. We have to resist creating a narrative. I know how tempting it is. But just by making a list of all those things, we can get 90% of the way through a picture without even knowing who painted it, when, you know, what the reason is, just by making a visual inventory. That doesn't mean a visual inventory of conclusions. It means a visual inventory of everything you see. And that's why I asked you, why do you think she's upset? What physically on her face? It allows you to tell me how to read body language. You have to physically tell me what it is you see that tells you that conclusion because your mind goes there so fast, you often don't break up those steps, okay? So what you might try to get your students to say to you is, well, she looks upset because I see this crease in between her eyebrows. And when people get that, it usually is a, an expression of sadness. Or when people are closed like this, closed body language, it usually indicates sadness. If people don't look at each other, it usually is some sort of sign of detachment. Um, if there is a parrot, a fancy parrot in the picture, it's usually a sign that that person can afford a fancy pet. And usually is some sort of indicator of some sort of wealth, like middle class or above. So these are the kinds of things that you want to draw out of students. Tell them physically what they see that led them to that conclusion, because you're trying to break up that conclusion that they just jumped to. Break it down into steps. Make them tell you what physically they see in the picture that, tell, that made them think that. Do you see that process slowed down? It's not about slow looking, it's about just saying the physical attributes without trying to conclude the story. All right, so now we're going to do a drawing exercise. So I want you to partner up with the person next to you. And one of you is going to look at the next slide and tell your partner what to draw. So if you're going to be drawing, you've got to face the other direction, OK? Yes, if you're the drawer, ask whatever questions you want. Let's, I mean, get that communication going both ways, you know? You only get five minutes, so make them count, okay? All right, and, and uh, 
And describers, you can look at what they're drawing. You don't have to try to, uh, I, I save that for the art history majors. <laughs> if they're art history majors and they're advanced, I make them do it back to back. <laughs> there are ways to make this much, much harder. I also do this in the galleries. I'll send the describers into a gallery pick of work of art. They got to come out into the hall and describe it to their partner. If they're advanced art history students, they only get to go in one time. So this is the way you can uh, scale it up to beginners or advanced. All right? So we're, I'm going to show the next image. All right? Five minutes starts now. All right, everybody. As they say, pencils down. <laughs> All right, so if you were the drawer, take a look at what you were drawing. Okay. All right, take a look. <laughs> All right. So how do, yeah. When you, have to take, when you have to take that previous image and actually apply it, when you actually have to physically describe physical characteristics, it's a whole nother ball game. So what was, what was easy to describe? Were there things that, low hanging fruit, were there things that were easier? You started somewhere, right? Seated Christ figure in the middle. A lot of people who, who, are, who grow up in Western American culture where they're exposed to Christianity and the, the stories and the imagery, saying seated Christ figure will get you a long way. All right? What else did you say? What else did you start with? Yeah, the, the arch, yeah. Yeah. Then what did you choose after the arch? The platform. The platform. Yeah. Mhm. Mm okay. So you started with a big picture, then you peopled it, and then you got into the nitty gritty details. Yeah, that's a common way that people start off breaking down an image when they have to describe it. Other people will start with, say, one figure, and then move to another figure, and then move up to another figure. So they'll do kind of, depending on the image, they'll do kind of a corner to corner to corner to corner. So that's another method. Yeah. What was difficult? The weird things in the background. Disembodied hands. Yes, disembodied hands. Yeah. Yes. Clear about position and direction because you know when you're seeing it, you see all those things, but you have to remember to say where things are and which way they're facing. Yes. Orientation, spatial distance. Yes. Scale. Yes. Yes. These are all things that we recognize visually, but to put it into words, you know, that's that's a tricky thing. That is very tricky. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is a really good way to kind of take the previous exercise with just visual analysis and taking it to the next level. Because if you actually have to dis physically describe something to somebody who can't see the image, then that tests your communication skills, your visual communication skills. Not just visual analysis, your communication. The interesting thing about the drawing exercise is that is immediate feedback about how well you're being understood, right? Because we can assume that someone is understanding everything we're saying, but this, this is the proof about whether or not they're understanding what you're saying. So this can tell you whether your idea of an arch is the same as someone else's idea of an arch, or your version of a disembodied hand is somebody else's version of a disembodied hand. Yeah, so this is, this is a great exercise for that, which is why it's used in a lot of docent training uh, uh, courses, uh, because it teaches people to get good at describing things to, to uh, visitors when they come to the museum.
We, have, we, go, we do this a lot with them. This is common practice in art museums across the country, common standard practice. The uncommon practice is using this with non-docents in the classroom setting, in the science classroom setting, in the medical school setting, in kind of these non-traditional settings. Um, so anyway, we have a few minutes left, so we could do questions, or you could trade places and do another image. It's up to you. You want to trade places? Okay, the describer becomes the drawer? Okay, all right, all right. You're old pros now. This is, this happens to be Fra Angelico at, uh, at the monastery where he was a Dominican monk in Florence, San Marco. Yeah, okay. All right, get in position, your old pros now. If there were things that you wish you had known, now's your time, you know a little bit more about it. Okay, is everybody ready? Okay, yeah. Okay, last image. Okay, five minutes. Starts now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, everybody. So take a look at what you were drawing. Take a look. This is a, a great uh, work by Kunisada, the 19th century Japanese woodblock printmaker. You know, there, there are ways to up the ante. There are ways to make this harder. You know, there are ways to make this harder. So you can adjust it for your advanced students. You can adjust it for graduate students who think they've got it who think they know, you know. So anyway, I hope this gave you a sense of being on both the giving of information side and the receiving of information side. And I asked my medical school students, I said, well, which did you prefer? Did you like being giving information or receiving it and interpreting it? Because you're gonna be on both sides, right? If you're a physician in the, and you're listening to your patient, you're gonna be receiving the information and inter interpreting it. And if you're a teacher, you're giving information. You're on that side. So a lot of people have a preference for one or the other. So I, I can't wait to hear over lunch what your favorite was. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for having me. I loved coming. And I can't wait to have lunch with you. And you know what? I do have a slide, a geology slide, just for you because I do abstract art. Sometimes I ask them to make word lists of any words or phrases that they think of when they see one of these, and they have to read their list to their group, and their group has to pick which one they, they chose, has to guess. That's another activity. Um, but for my scientists, oh, art history. If you get to describe an image, a Monet, of a bridge to your fellow student, and then you have to pick which one of these <laughs> the, the, drawer, or the, the drawer has to decide which one they, that their partner was looking at. So this is also advanced. And for my scientists, um, I guess I didn't include it. I have, I grew up in Green River, Wyoming, and there are red rock cliffs. One was, it was painted by Albert Bierstadt. It was painted by another artist. It's been photographed for tourist magazines, and I include images of all of them. And I pick one and show it to, this, to uh, the describer, and then the drawer has to decide which image they saw. Did they see a photograph? Did they see a painting? <laughs> Did they see a drawing, a watercolor? Because oftentimes the one thing that we don't talk about is medium. Was it a painting we just saw? Was it a sculpture? Was it a drawing? Was it a photo? That's often taken for granted. We forget to say what it's made of. You know, 
So anyway, that's one way that we can you know, shake it up for the scientists too, because if they have to describe the strata that they're talking about, if you give, show them multiple pictures of strata, could they pick it out in a lineup? Well, that's a good question. So anyway, thank you so much. Let's talk more over lunch. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Thank you very much.